Welcome to another video from the Heart Factory. In today's video, we will be talking about the reservoirs, the oxygenators and the hemotherm. The video will be in detailed description of the reservoirs, the things one should know about the reservoirs in the first part. The second part will deal about the oxygenators and the third part will deal about the hemotherm. I guess the video will be a bit long, so it will come in parts A, B and C and the interested audience may continue watching it till the end to make a sense of the video. So without wasting much time, let's get started with the video. As we all know, reservoirs are of two types, the closed collapsible type and the open hard shell type. Now the reservoir or the so-called atrium is a chamber that receives the venous blood from the patient and also from other sources like the cardiotomy and the vent. Apart from this, it is a chamber that facilitates the venous bubble trap, provides a convenient place to add drugs, fluids and blood to the system and also allows to sample blood for various reasons. Now apart from this, reservoir adds storage capacity to the heart lung system to be dispensed to the patient by the roller pump as and when needed. Now the conventional method of going on cardiopulmonary bypass relies on gravity and height difference between the venous cannula tip and the venous reservoir blood level. The reservoir to the patient height distance is usually around 30 to 40 inches. Therefore, this kind of a drainage is limited by the internal diameter and length of the drainage catheter, the central venous pressure, the tubing internal diameter and the tubing internal length, the venous reservoir air pressure, the height difference, etc. Now the hard shell reservoir or the open system usually comprises of a polycarbonate housing which is a hard shell usually transparent kind of a housing with a depth filter and a polyurethane deformer and usually incorporate a cardiotomy reservoir and a deforming compartment. Previously, the cardiotomy reservoir used to come as a separate unit but in the current era, the cardiotomy unit is incorporated within the reservoir but the blood that is sucked through the cardiotomy goes through a separate filter and a deformer before settling down in the reservoir to be propelled to the oxygenator. The reservoir component of the CPB circuit therefore provides a highly efficient filtration function, highly efficient deforming function and also removes foreign particles. Now filters and deforming compartments in the venous reservoir and air trapping pores are located at the highest level of the blood flow path within the oxygenator to allow passive removal of the air. Mind you, this is an open system and air went by itself automatically. Now, venous blood has a high flow rate and is clean. It needs only relatively little deforming, mostly for removal of micro air before being stored in the reservoir. But the cardiotomy blood that is recovered by suction from the surgical field has a low flow rate and is heavily aerated, that is foamy and contains a substantial amount of cell and surgical debris. Therefore, the cardiotomy blood has to undergo considerable deforming and filtering before being reused into the systemic circuit. So, the current construction of this hard shell reservoir effectively removes not only the debris and the air bubble at the blood air interface, but also removes micro air in the venous flow. Now the blood in the reservoir is exposed to air surrounding the device in much the same way as it is exposed in the bubble oxygenator reservoir. As blood volume in this reservoir increases, air is vented out of the reservoir to accommodate the blood. And as the blood volume in the reservoir decreases, air is pulled into the reservoir. So this open system provides an unlimited source of air that could be potentially delivered to the circuit. Now the deformers are nothing but they are silicon antifoam agents that disrupt the bubbles and return the blood to a liquid phase. 
Deforming or anti-forming agents are used to break up or reduce bubbles that form at the blood air interface. The most commonly used agent being polydimethyl siloxane, the silicon agent in which ruptures the bubble membranes and ultimately disrupts the foam and transferring the blood to the liquid phase. So a double column structure is provided within this Harshal reservoir, the first for receiving and degassing venous blood and the second for receiving, filtering and deforming cardiac tunnel blood or blood from other sources. As said before, this reservoir has a lot of connection at the top end which can be used to de-air, to prime the circuit, to add drugs and bloods to the circuit, etc. It also has a sampling line where you can draw blood to check for ABGs. A level of fluid is maintained in the reservoir for the duration of CPB. If you overrun the minimum operating volume of a reservoir, which is usually around 300 ml in adults and I guess around 50 ml in kids depending on the body weight and surface area, there is a risk of perfusion accident such as pumping large volumes of air into the arterial circulation and the membrane oxygenator thereby leading to massive air embolism. So one has to always perfuse keeping in mind the minimum operating volume of the reservoir and that's where the level detectors come in handy. Therefore, the open system has several advantages in terms of having better visibility of the reservoir level. They allow an easier passive elimination of air entering from the venous and cardiotomy lines. So you need not suck the air once you go on bypass. The air migrates to the top of the reservoir and escapes by itself. It has a large storage capacity. It has a recirculation line which you can use to pre-oxygenate the venous blood in certain situations. Now because the cardiotomy is integrated within this reservoir, the priming volume is reduced and it eliminates that extra connection you need for having a separate cardiotomy and therefore also permits a small bore venous line if you happen to use vacuum assisted venous drainage. So when conventional gravity doesn't achieve satisfactory venous drainage, say during minimal invasive cardiac and neonatal surgeries, vacuum assisted drainage is utilized. Now what is this vacuum assisted venous drainage? Vacuum assisted venous return is nothing but utilization of a vacuum system to generate negative pressure within this hard shell venous reservoir, thereby augmenting venous drainage during cardiopulmonary bypass. So this venous assisted vacuum drainage requires a closed venous system with a negative pressure region usually a sealed hard shell reservoir with an integrated oxygenator and a vacuum regulator to adjust the negative pressure as needed. The vacuum regulator should be limited to certain range and must have a negative and positive pressure relief valves. When a hard shell reservoir is utilized for vacuum assist, all the connections at the top of the reservoir should be closed lest the vacuum won't work. The level of the venous reservoir should always be monitored when on vacuum assisted venous drainage for increased venous return and accordingly the pump flow rate has to be increased to maintain adequate perfusion and adequate reservoir level. The negative pressure can be increased to achieve the appropriate blood level rate with minimum vacuum assistance whenever necessary. Excessive negative pressure should be avoided to minimize the risk of hemolysis and the chattering phenomenon which may reduce venous return. Now because we are utilizing vacuum for venous drainage, there is no question of relying on the height differential between the patient's heart and the venous reservoir. Moreover, it is possible to raise the height of the venous reservoir, shorten the venous and arterial lines 
and decrease the tubing diameter as well when you use a vacuum assisted venous drainage. With smaller cannulae and shorter tubing, VAVD could dramatically reduce priming volumes, maximally decrease tubing dead space and lower patient hemodilution. Now there is a negative pressure threshold of minus 120 millimeters mercury beyond which the relationship between the negative pressure and the blood damage becomes linear. It is of importance to note that the negative pressure present in the venous cannulae is the sum of the venous reservoir negative pressure and the siphon gravity pressure. Now entry of air into the venous line during CPB is common and the deforming material in the reservoir will take care of that air and dissolve it into the liquid phase. However, the venous air that is entrained when the patient is on VAVD is said to be the main source of gaseous microemboli in the arterial line during cardiopulmonary bypass. Therefore, when a VAVD with a negative pressure is used, one has to be careful not to increase the negative pressure to more than minus 50 because it not only reduces the flow delivered by the roller pump, it may also result in creation of gas. Now increased negative pressure at the inlet of the raceway tubing reduces the re-expansion of the tubing, thereby resulting in net reduction of the stroke volume. So when you convert a hard shell reservoir for vacuum assisted venous drainage, you are basically converting an open system into a closed system and it's of very importance to measure the reservoir pressure lest one may land up in a serious accident. So VAVD has several advantages in terms of smaller venous cannulae that will facilitate cannulation during minimal invasive cardiac surgery. It will decrease the priming volume and maximize the surgical visibility. It will decrease the volume of blood transfused. It increases venous drainage and eliminates the risk of air blocks in the venous line. It will also help in maintaining an emptier heart and a drier operative field. The disadvantages being it induces blood trauma if the vacuum pressure is too high. It may potentially draw air into the venous line. It reduces pump flow as said before if you increase the negative pressure because in the raceway the tubing will not re-expand. It will complicate the existing CPB circuit. It may lead to serious damage or accidents if the perfusion technologist is not aware of the way to use VAVD. The problem with this open system or the hard shell reservoir are that the circulating blood is exposed to a larger and more complex surface that contains deforming sponges and antifoam agents and the use of cardiotomy suction, especially uncontrolled cardiotomy, results in significant increase in thrombi, neutrophil and platelet activation as well as release of unwanted cytokines. A quick word about the reaction time which is nothing but the period of time before the arterial or the venous reservoir empties if the venous flow is emptied abruptly. At any given time, the minimum reservoir level required for the next 15 to 20 seconds should be maintained to avoid massive embolization into the oxygenator and the patient. Now the closed systems are collapsible polyvinyl chloride bags that have a minimum surface area and a thin single layer of screen filter. Now they require a separate external cardiotomy as you can see here for cardiotomy suction. The air that comes from the venous line whilst going on bypass accumulates in this bag and has to be actively aspirated. Now this closed system is thought to provide an element of safety because of a reduced contact surface of the blood with the air or plastic and also if the bag is accidentally emptied during bypass, say for example if someone clamps the venous line suddenly or if you just overrun the venous reservoir level, it collapses and large amounts of air cannot be delivered to the patient. There is no need for a deformer in this setup as there is no blood air interface and the blood is said to simply flow into this bag that is already filled with blood. One of the problems with this closed system kind of reservoir is that adding a vacuum assist is a bit of a problem because it is not hard enough 
though there are alternative methods with this particular system to put in a vacuum assist device. If you like the video, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel. Don't forget to click the bell just to be notified of my next video in time. I would really appreciate if you can leave some constructive comments for all of us to learn. And I also want you to keep watching this space for future videos that will appear every weekend. Till then, thanks for watching. Happy weaving. Thank you.